start, I would like to welcome everybody to these um, NCI CCR liver cancer program seminar series that we finally decided to start again. And I'm very, very pleased um, to actually have um, uh, Ludmilla Prokonina also speak to, um, today together with her staff scientist, Olizugon Onabaya. They come um, from um, DCEG. Ludmilla did her, got her, her PhD from Uppsala University um, in Sweden, and she actually joined NIH in 2005 as a visiting fellow with nobody less than Francis Collins. In 2008, she joined the Laboratory of Translational Genomics of DCEG, and she was a tenure track and then a tenured investigator in 2014. And in 2018, she was appointed as the LTG chief. Uh, she was. She explores connections between she was identified gene susceptibility variants and molecular phenotypes of importance for cancer and immunity, including infection. And this is basically in the context um, of liver diseases. And one of the uh, uh, molecules she's very interested in um, is human interferon lambda four, which was discovered in her lab through a follow-up of one of the GWAS findings, and I'm sure we're going to hear more about this um, during her talk. And as many of us, she also works um, now on SARS-CoV infection. And uh, Sigun received his uh, Bachelor of Pharmacy degree in Nigeria, and then um, his PhD at the University of Maryland College Park in 2008. And in 2013, he joined uh, Miller's group um, at um, DCEG and has been promoted to a staff scientist in 2016. And he has been instrumental in establishing the findings to explore the role of interferon lambda in cancer and infection. And I believe the two are gonna give this talk jointly. I hope one after the other and not in parallel. And the title of the talk is The Role of Interferon Lambda 4 in Liver Disease, Why and How? <laughs> now we need to hear Miller. Miller. I'm trying to share yeah, my yeah. screen, but I don't have this privilege right now. Is uh, if anyone Okay, I'm a presenter now. Good. Good. Okay, hopefully you got it now. You can see my screen. It's still black, at least for me it is black. Now it comes. No, no, no. Okay. Now we can see it's coming up. Okay. Um, I actually have you covering my screen. You want me to go away? Okay, no, it's fine now. So if you see my screen, then we are good. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so we will be talking today with Shigun, and I will start and introduce the subject, and I will leave the hard part for Shigun. So he will be talking about molecular mechanisms and implications as, uh, as we see them now because it's an emerging field and we, of course we don't know everything, but we tell you what we know. So it so happened that in 2013, we discovered a novel interferon, which was eventually named as interferon lambda-4, and it was in a great collaboration with the NDCAG, with Tom O'Brien and other people in uh, NIH, such as Barbara Rehrman and uh, FDA, uh, as uh, um, um, Ray Donnelly and people from outside of NIH. And as you can appreciate that uh, there are several uh, interference in this cytokine, class of cytokine family members, and you can recognize interferon gamma, the oldest one, or the, the second oldest one, and type one interference as alpha and beta. And then the family of type three interference, also known as uh, interferon lambdas, which were discovered in 2002. And then uh, eventually we discovered uh, lambda four in 2013, and it's uh, distantly uh, related to this family, but uh, you can see how distantly. It's really a second cousin in this family of very similar proteins. And that's the reason why uh, lambda-4 was not discovered together with other type 3 interference, because it's so different from them. 
and how we got into this business. Uh, so we got into this business because of a GWAS association, which was reported in 2009 for both uh, spontaneous clearance of HCV and uh, treatment induced uh, on treatment with uh, interferon alpha and ribavirin treatment uh, and uh, obtaining, uh, achieving sustained biologic response as we are. And uh, so there are two markers which appear to be in the same region associated with the same, uh, about the same strength of uh, association with the odds ratio between three to 10, which is extremely strong and basically unheard of for human genetics for any other complex disease. And this uh, association came in the same region between uh, genes, which were at that time were known as IL-1020, IL-28B and IL-28A. And with our discovery, all of these genes were renamed now to be uh, consistent with the common nomenclature as lambda 1, 2, and 3, and then eventually lambda 4. And you may recognize this marker, which is uh, still known as referred to IL-28B, but it's uh, technically it's uh, this RS number. And this region uh, includes this interference, which are very similar in, on genetic level as well, with uh, about 95% uh, similarity on uh, DNA and cDNA level. And just to make uh, this story short, we apply different methods as RNA sequencing, uh, very general molecular cloning, very old fashioned, and then functional annotation to show that this new transcribed region includes multiple transcripts. And you can see the complexity, and in blue is an open reading frame. The complexity was based on inclusion of different exons, which were shifting frames depending on this inclusion, and also um, by uh, a genetic variant in the what happened occurred to be the first exon in, in this novel region. And uh, the delta G allele refers to one base missing, and T allele means that substitution by two alleles, which are T and T, but they are not independent, so it always goes together. It's TT or just G, one base is missing. And it results in a frame shift, and uh, only the delta G allele, as we call it, uh, it, it makes a full length protein, which is now also uh, here, uh, 179 amino acids which includes all exons and uh, provides uh, a protein which is similar to um, the other tetra interference, relatively similar, but uh, it, the TT allele does not support this open reading frame, and it leads to early termination in the second exon because the frame shift is already in the first exon. So it's basically a, a subject of nonsense mediated decay, and it does not go far. So now with our uh, contribution, this region was resolved and it showed that this uh, IL-28B marker is actually not uh, uh, IL-28B anymore and not even lambda-3 anymore, but it's uh, interferon lambda-4 marker, but located within intron uh, 2 uh, of, of this uh, variant, uh, while the functional variant located in the first exon is really defining the existence of this uh, new protein. And what is uh, good to see that this signal was really close to the uh, functional one, only 367 bases away. And uh, it improved and uh, explained this signal completely. What is uh, interesting, just to, I, I saw it somewhere in publication that uh, it was a paper published in 2018, which reported the most um, uh, uh, commonly said, uh, the most uh, most published genes, new genes, which are uh, comparing between 2000, before 2010 and 2015. And uh, both lambda-3 and lambda-4 were named among these genes. And uh, this is interesting because uh, obviously lambda-4 was a new gene because it was renamed in 2013. And lambda-4 was a completely new gene which did not exist before, which makes sense. So there was no literature on it before 2010 and even before 2013. And it was in 2015, so it's just only about two years after the publication. But these are the uh, stats which I looked up today, 
which shows 516 and 718 uh, ATA publications uh, uh, referring specifically in the title the Lambda 4, Lambda 3, which are this new gene or newly renamed gene, which is kind of curious. So they are outliers, but it's good to be outlier here. So what does it mean uh, having this allele or another allele? Uh, in terms of producing this interference, all humans can be divided in two types for this purpose. Uh, people who have produ can produce all four interference, and it contributes to such frequencies that uh, Africans, uh, African ancestry people produce most of this haplotype and Asians uh, least. Uh, and then another group of people who will never produce lambda-4 in no circumstances. And it's a, obviously it's a reverse uh, frequency. And there are only two interference in, in the mouse, which uh, shows that uh, a, a very large proportion of humans are natural knockouts for lambda-4 and will never produce it and appear to be totally okay with, with this uh, uh, situation or maybe even better than okay uh, compared to other people, especially in face of different viral infections. And uh, this is uh, just to show you how much of Lambda-4 uh, resembles other interference from the same family, and it's not so much. So it's maximum 29% amino acid identity, and it's mostly uh, concentrated in this uh, C-terminal part where the receptor one of the receptors is binding, and it also shows a, a few amino acids uh, in red. They are uh, amino acids which are missing, and they are important. So, in general, these uh, uh, missing amino acids are located in specific non-overlapping haplotypes, and uh, they have some also uh, preference uh, depending on the population. So, this haplotype. Is all, so all of them exist only on a delta G haplotype. That means only when you are able to produce protein, you may have an additional variant, which suggests that there is some kind of fine tuning is going on, which is also probably suggests that it's important to have some fine tuning. Otherwise, why would you have that? Um, so no, if there is no protein, there is no need for fine tuning of this protein. And uh, this specifically variant is important because it's common, uh, relatively common in uh, different populations. And it has been shown already in multiple, uh, in several studies that um, combining this information by uh, for two variants uh, has a significance for outcomes of uh, uh, peg interferon ribavirin treatment um, and for a induction of ISGs. And also uh, induction of ISGs by uh, by combinant proteins. So based on this information, both genetics and uh, outcomes of treatments and uh, in vitro work, it has been suggested that uh, it's not just yes or no lambda four, but it's yes or uh, no lambda four at all if you have TT allele. But then depending on the alleles of these two uh, of the variant, it it would be uh, weak. Uh, lambda-4 functionally weak, which is uh, better than uh, the strong, uh, functionally strong variant uh, for response to treatment. And uh, so it's it's three groups now, uh, which is now uh, pretty standardly considered for uh, different association studies, because it's also an indication that it's effect of lambda-4 and not lambda-3. So the question now is why in the liver? Uh, and the short answer is it's probably because of the receptors. So type one interferon compared to type three interferers, it, it use their different sets of receptors, and uh, these receptors are expressed in basically everywhere, and that's why uh, the effect is systemic. Uh, both good effect and uh, bad effect is systemic, uh, which explains uh, negative effects. Uh, of treatments, but type three interference utilize their own receptors, uh, lambda receptor one and IL-10 receptor two or B, which are more restricted specifically uh, interferon receptor one, which is expressed really just in epithelial cells and in hepatocytes. And it's considered to be um, a type three interference considered to be a group of interference working on the entry side. 
and uh, barrier surfaces, including hepatocytes. And we know for sure that hepatocytes are inducing, uh, being induced, and they produce both type 1, uh, both uh, uh, lambda 3 and lambda 4. Uh, and it, they are not expressed at baseline, so they really have to be induced. But after whatever interferon it will produce a signal, it will be equally transmitted to uh, the, this complex and induce a very exactly, basically, essentially the same set of IHGs. So it doesn't matter which interferon induced it, type 1 or type 3, the outcome is probably going to be the same. And the question is, of course, now, so we know that lambda 4 is a very strong factor for non-clearance of HCV and uh, helping to establish chronic HCV infection, which leads to cirrhosis and then to liver cancer. But the question is, would lambda 4 affect cirrhosis and would lambda 4 affect HCC uh, directly? And we were trying to address these questions and, uh, in, in our study, but uh, it's been already reported that Surprisingly, even though it's known that um, delta G allele is associated with risk of um, HCV, uh, but it was shown to be inversely associated with risk of cirrhosis, and uh, surprisingly, in various circumstances, both for viral and non-viral chronic liver disease. So that was already reported in, in 2005. First, it was really shocking and surprising, but we actually do see evidence for that. And uh, in this work, we've been working with uh, Reveal to study from Taiwan. And we looked at, uh, and this study has a very large set of patients who were treated by interferon alpha ribavirin and then monitoring for progression to HCC. And they had uh, cirrhosis data at, uh, at the beginning of the study. So we can see that there is a significant association uh, for having less cirrhosis. It's basically about one-third less cirrhosis in patients who have a combined delta G and delta G uh, homozygous genotype, and we are combining them because it's very uncommon in Asians. As I showed, it's about 5% allele frequency, so we don't have enough power to do on by genotype. So we combine it, just not having any lambda-4 and having at least one copy. And we also looked at progression uh, for to HCC dependent on uh, SVR, and it's it's kind of busy. But the only point I'm making here is that if you achieve an SVR, then the genotype doesn't matter. So p values are 0 0.9, 0 0.96. So it's basically absolutely no risk to progress to HCC if SVR is achieved. But if SVR is never achieved uh, after initial treatment or treatment, there is some residual risk to get uh, uh, to have association with lambda-4, uh, and uh, the OS ratios are much stronger, 1.7, 1.8 uh, OS ratios, but uh, the numbers are not uh, very big, and uh, the associations are not statistically significant, but uh, trending to, towards that. And we also look at um, the association uh, progression to H HCC, uh, after uh, uh, stratifying by cirrhosis status. And here again, so it's it's known that for HCV patients with cirrhosis, there is much higher risk of, uh, of uh, getting um, H HCC. And you can see here that uh, in carriers of delta G allele with uh, cirrhosis, the O3 ratios are between 0.18 to 3.3, depending on adjustment of, on different factors. But these uh, different covariates are obviously very important because the p-values are uh, very uh, declining very quickly. But the crude association is very significant. So uh, confirming that uh, cirrhosis is very important risk factors. But uh, in even in the patients without cirrhosis, we could see that uh, delta G allele has importance uh, much lower than in patients without or with cirrhosis, uh, but the significance is also uh, declining very quickly, uh, pointing out that uh, achieving an SVR is probably the most important factor, no matter how it was achieved, achieved how many times it was treated or retreated. But as soon as you achieved uh, achieved an SVR, it's it's already a, it's already good. The risk is de decreased significantly regardless of of genotype. 
And uh, it's it's been always a question if uh, lambda four plays a role in HPV, and this is an analysis uh, in a, in a in a group of H, uh, HC uh, HPV patients who were uh, with HCC or just persistent or achieved spontaneous clearance and uh, without too much going through the table. It just basically there is absolutely no risk associated with lambda four in progression to liver cancer or in patients with HPV. So uh, in conclusion for, for this part, uh, we can say that uh, lambda-4 is produced by hepatocytes in response to HCV in individuals, uh, only in individuals with delta G allele. And um, the uh, effect is, uh, is not limited, but uh, the main effect uh, which we see is in the liver because this is a tissue and cells uh, that uh, express both of these receptors. And uh, lambda-4 doesn't seem to be playing a role in HPV infection and progression to HCC, but it could be, um, and, but we see that it's associated with uh, decreased cirrhosis even without uh, viral infection, and uh, uh, still potentially there is some increased residual effect for high risk to go uh, to progress to cancer, but only in patients not achieving an SVR. And this uh, duality of lambda-4 increase in risk for chronic HCV, but at the same time decrease in the risk of, of cirrhosis might be uh, an explanation why we don't see a stronger association with liver cancer, because that would be really expected if uh, lambda-4 has a strong effect on, HCC, uh, on HCV. But of course, HCV is just a, a one small not small, but one uh, reason to de uh, develop liver cancer. Maybe it's not um, that uh, strong uh, overall if you consider all the patients. And maybe um, uh, inhibiting lambda-4 could be a, a, a way to inhibit um, and facilitate viral clearance in combination with other treatment. And uh, this is just um, some of our, our collaborators for, for this specific part of the work. And uh, Shigun will continue uh, with more functional work. And if you have any questions at this point, so while we are making transitions, please ask. So I didn't mention this earlier, but if you have any questions, you have to put them in the uh, chat box, I believe. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, um, Miller. Um, can anybody see my screen? Am I, am I sharing? Yep. Okay, fantastic. So um, Miller has done the um, general introduction, so I'll just dive straight into uh, our work which has been a collaboration of many, many people over the years. And so it's just a compilation of our um, greatest hits, so to speak, in the functional area. Uh, so this picture, when I first came into the lab, really intrigued me. And I told Miller that, hey, this protein that you discovered uh, seems to be accumulating uh, in the cell, in these um, structures, um, these um, vesicular structures. At that time, we didn't know what structures they were. So on the, on, the, on the left is a patient is a primary human hepatocytes from donors with uh, if now four genotype uh, with this red dots all over after they have been treated with uh, um, a mimic of viral infection and poly IC and on the on the sorry on the left on the right you see a, a donor a primary human hepatocytes from a donor with uh, the TT genotype that is they cannot make interferon lambda four. And you can see that there's no red dots in those uh, people because they're not making the protein. So well, what we did was to develop stable cell lines uh, to, was to transfer if now four into hep G2 cell lines and start using different markers of, um, of structures, subcellular structures, to try and identify where the protein was accumulating. And here I'm just showing you a video. And in this video, we, are, we have a marker for the lysosomes. And you can see clearly that interferon lambda-4 is accumulating in the lysosome, lysosomal structures. When you look at the Golgi and early endosomes, we see much less, much less localization. But when you look at the lysosome, it's clear that these are the structures where interferon lambda-4 was accumulating. This immediately suggested to us that lambda-4 
was likely a misfolded protein that was being trashed into the lysosomes, basically. Here is just a halo control where you can see clearly that there's no effect of um, the control halo, which is a tag we use that gave the red color. Uh, you don't see any distribution into those structures as well. So this led us to think that it's possible that when you overexpress lambda four due to the um, due to the misfolded protein response, it could be inducing AR stress response. So we developed stable cell lines expressing either interferon lambda three, interferon lambda four, or we knocked out the receptor of interferon of interferon lambdas. And what we could clearly see after in eight, uh, 24 and 72 hours was um, induction of ER stress markers. Uh, most of them are very common ER stress markers. They are highly induced as early as eight hours in cells expressing interferon lambda four. We further tested the most common uh, ER stress effectors per um, XPP1 DDIT3. And using gene expression assays, we could clearly see that ER stress was being induced, both at the gene expression level and at the protein level, looking at DDIT3, also known as CHOM. So previously, we had seen that when we overexpress lambda-4 in hep G2 cells, there's increased apoptosis. So we wondered whether this ER stress response and the misfolded protein response was responsible for the increased apoptosis that we were observing. And indeed, when we knock down DDIT3, which is an effector of um, the ER stress response, um, you could see that you could see that knockdown of DDIT3 in reduced apoptosis and increased cell viability. So, in conclusion, we see that lambda four is a misfolded protein that induces ER stress and apoptosis via the misfolded protein response. Then we switch gears and basically started to observe some other interesting features of interferon lambda four. One of them was the fact that not only was lambda four, interferon lambda four accumulating in, in the primary human hepatocytes, which you can see here in the Western blot, when you look at the lysate, you see high levels of lambda four in patients with DGDG. But when you look in the media of the cells that were cultured with viruses, we don't see any interferon lambda four in the media. But you see that in patient in uh, donors that have lambda four, when you infect their primary human hepatocytes with Sendai virus, the levels of um, interferon stimulated genes are higher at early time points, at six hours, compared to donors with uh, the TTTT genotype, telling us that this uh, type three interferon is produced at very small quantities, barely secreted, but it is still inducing a strong ISG response. So we wondered how is this occurring? So to test that, we developed this assay where we took a cell line that could inducibly produce interferon lambda-4, and we co-cultured it with a reporter cell line, measuring interferon lambda-4 in the media constantly. And then we measured luciferase activity. And what did this tell us? It showed us that even at concentrations where we cannot detect interferon lambda-4, which by eight hours we still see nothing, we can see high ISG uh, interferon stimulated response activity basically suggesting that the interferon is active as an interferon at undetectable concentrations. This is compared to interferon lambda three, which is well secreted and could be easily detected in the media as soon as six hours. But the activity was nowhere close to interferon lambda four. What this told us is that interferon lambda four is active as an interferon at concentrations below 100 picograms per mil which is highly unusual for type three interferons. They are not known to be that potent. So the question I had was, why is it so potent? Well, what I saw from my confocal microscopy analysis was that over time, lambda four seemed to be redistributing to the cell surface where you can see clearly this nice ring forming at the cell surface of cells, of uh, hep G2 cells that are uh, overexpressing interferon lambda four. In the next picture, what I'm showing you here is two cells, uh, a live image of two cells, one expressing interferon lambda four and one exposed to interferon lambda four that I'm circling here. And when you play it, you can see clearly that lambda four is accumulating on the cell surface of this cell that is exposed to the lambda four producing cells. And it appears to be some sort of connection between the two of them that's, that's going on. 
between these two um, proteins and uh, two cells. And when you go to the next slide, I'm showing you an inset of two cells, one producing lambda four and one exposed to lambda four. And the, circle, the area I'm circling is where I, I, I believe some interaction might be taking place between these two cells. And what I was able to see was the trafficking of proteins from the cells that are producing lambda four here and going in, interacting with cells that are not producing lambda four. So it seems sort of some sort of membrane exchange might be going on. I show this uh, insert here on the left because I just want to show the cell boundary where the cells contact each other. And um, I enhanced this image here on the, on the right because I wanted to really show the lambda four, which is in red. So we developed an assay to basically see whether we can quantify surface accumulation of interferon lambda four. And what we did in this assay was to take interferon lambda four expressing cells here on the left and uh, expose it to head G2 cells that are not expressing lambda four. We co-culture them for some time. And then we, because the interferon lambda four that this cell is producing has a GFP tag, we can monitor what's on the cell surface with an anti-GFP biotin tag. So we, we, we label the cells with anti-GFP biotin, then we use PE with a fluorescence marker to track how much biotin is on the cell surface. And we, using flow cytometry, we can distinguish the cells producing interferon lambda four here on the left from cells that are exposed to interferon lambda four on the right. And what you can clearly see is that in both populations, the ones that are producing lambda-4 and exposed to lambda-4, there is increased biotin levels on their cell surface, telling us that interferon lambda-4 is accumulating on the cell surface of cells that are producing interferon lambda-4 and cells that are exposed to lambda-4. As a control, we did not see a similar phenotype when we use interferon lambda-3 or a GFP control. So this is a new observation that interferon lambda-4 accumulates on the cell surface. The next question that we wanted to ask was, does interferon lambda-4 signal from the cell surface? To do that experiment, what we did was to take these cells that have been exposed to lambda-4 and sort them. When we sorted them, we now cultured them with uh, another cell line that has an interferon response reporter, which is luciferase. We incubated them over, overnight, and we now measured the surface activity. And what is clear is that the cells that have been exposed to lambda-4, they don't produce it, but they were just exposed to it, have a strong ISRE activity, which means that interferon lambda-4 is accumulating on the surface of cells, and it is signaling from the, that surface. So even though it is poorly expressed, it's able to accumulate on the cell surface over time from where it can signal. And this, we believe, is a novel signaling mechanism that hasn't been described for uh, type 3 interferon before. So we believe this surface accumulation may be responsible for increased interferon signaling. We see this observation when we take HEP, um, HEP G2 cell lines over expressing interferon lambda 4, which is in red compared to interferon lambda 3. When we take primary human hepatocytes that are expressing lambda-4 compared to lambda-3, we also see higher expression of most ISGs when you compare to interferon lambda-3 expressing cells. And even in HCV-infected livers, uh, we can see that interferon lambda-4 genotype is associated with higher levels of um, ISG induction compared to TT, um, no interferon lambda-4, as has been published by many, many other studies. Also, we believe that the surface interferon lambda-4 expression may also be responsible for increased negative regulation that we observed when we looked at cells expressing interferon lambda-4, where USP18 and SOX1 was highly induced by interferon lambda-4 expression. And we believe that might also be playing a role with uh, the problems it has with, with interferon alpha treatment. And finally, we believe that surface accumulation of interferon lambda-4 may be inhibiting proliferation by increasing IRF1 expression. In this experiment, we collaborated with some bioinformaticians, um, Mauro Castro, where they did regulome analysis, basically trying to analyze which transcription factors are highly active in cells expressing interferon lambda-4 
and you compare them to cells expressed in interferon lambda 3 and interferon lambda 4 with the receptor knockout. One of the ones that was most strongly induced was IRF1. And IRF1 was highly expressed in interferon lambda 4 relative to lambda 3. And when we knocked out this anti IRF1, we see that the anti proliferative effect that we observed earlier was actually knocked out by IRF1 inhibition by siRNA. So in conclusion, we have this mechanism that we are proposing. And that what we're saying is that when HCV infects a hepatocyte, it induces high ISG induction in that hepatocyte. And it's able to accumulate on the cell surface of that hepatocyte and signal to the neighboring hepatocytes to also induce higher ISG induction. But it will not go far because by the time you get to the third one, there's a reduction in the signaling because there's, not, there's much less accumulation of the interferon. So it's, it's, it's really working more in a paracrine version. We believe this is responsible for this high ISG induction due to surface accumulation is what needs to increase negative regulation of interferon responses and interferon lambda 4 overexpression due to expression due to causes ER stress that could also be leading to reduced proliferation of hepatocytes. A combination of this may be leading to chronic HCV over time. So in the future, we hope to be able to actually evaluate HCV infected liver tissue for surface accumulation of lambda 4 because this has not been described before. And we would like to also understand the mechanism. How is it gets, it's getting stuck to the surface? What interactions are responsible for this? We hope to develop small molecule inhibitors for it now for, and hopefully we will expand our functional studies to immune cell subsets. This effort was not by myself only, it was a group effort by a lot of talented scientists, including Jocelyn, Adiola, Oscar, Ralph, all of them contributed extensively to this work. We also have collaborators, uh, Ms. Wan Lee, um, Mauro Castro, Gordon Robertson, and Thomas O'Brien, all uh, were very important collaborators on this project. Uh, thank you. And um, I think we're ready for questions now. Thank, thank you. That was was very interesting. Thank you, both of you. Um, be, before I get any messages and, and, and look into, I, I have a quick question about the molecule in general. Yeah. So you initially uh, found this in the context of hepatitis C and, and treatment uh, response um, to hepatitis C. Now, obviously, from a from a hepatology perspective, hepatitis C has become history now with the DAAs. So, where do you see this molecule to be relevant in the in the near future? Um, Bill, I want to want to take a stab at that. So we definitely, picture. yeah, we definitely started from HCV, uh, but it's uh, like with a lot of things, uh, it, we found it in HCV because it was uh, probably most low hanging fruit, but now mm -hmm. we see its connection to multiple different phenotypes. So some people in the audience can uh, attest to that. We see association with prostate cancer for development uh, of prostate cancer in people who were exposed to presumably viral infections earlier in life. We see, we just published a paper about outcomes of bone marrow transplantation also associated with uh, lambda-4, which uh, implicates lambda-4 as a new marker in addition to HLA matching to select donors for um, bone marrow transplantation. So in, we, we see connection to um, multiple unexpected places, which, which just tells you that an essential part of immune response, especially genetically regulated immune response, it will manifest in conditions where this immune response is important. We don't see, so preempting the, uh, the question about COVID, no, it doesn't look like it's playing a role in COVID, uh, even though we were basically completely sure that it would. You know, but it, it's probably there are so many other important factors in COVID that it masks anything else. Uh, and uh, so, but at least so far, we kind of keep, uh, keep an eye on the results coming from the, the genetic studies. And uh, there is no indication that Lambda-4 is playing a role there. But in multiple other infections and in cancer, it, it plays a role. So, 
Even so, if it's going to be not relevant for exactly HCV and treatment outcomes, it's still important. So do you mind if I ask a question over the internet instead of writing down? Mm -hmm, sure. This is really fascinating talk and give a much better now, I'm just curious. Uh, so, if you would speculate, right, that uh, all of the connection of lambda 4 is somewhat linking to disease, uh, would you speculate how this allele is evolutionally selected? What are the benefits for the selection for getting this allele that to be misfolded and using ER stress or sensing? Um. So I usually show a slide and I might uh, just show you uh, here because there's obviously there is a selection for not producing lambda 4. So uh, primates uh, have a non polymorphic ability to produce lambda 4. OK, so it's it's uh, and we already published a paper which says that uh, producing lambda 4 was probably important in primates, but there something happened in a evolution line to humans all of a sudden it became a liability. So uh, being uh, able to produce lambda-4 probably interfered with some uh, not pleasant infections, definitely not HCV, but could be some other infections, you know, including some other RNA viruses, maybe Ebola, we never got to know that, but it obviously was on the way of clearance of some infections. And since then, uh, humans are actively trying to get rid of it. Uh, which means basically it kills people carrying them the four. Probably not in the last century because the selection uh, pressure was much weaker, but in the last uh, few thousand and or few hundred years, it was obviously very, very strongly selected. But surprisingly, there's a still highest frequency of lambda four in Africa, and we keep trying to figure out why. Uh, and we are speculating that it must be playing a role providing some benefit, especially to children in Africa, that if they survive this early childhood with uh, Lambda 4, it, whatever comes later may not kill them, you know, or may or definitely not going to kill all of them. So it's it's a significant benefit in a very specific circumstances, which could be in African conditions, in uh, conditions of sickle cell or malaria. And we are doing some of, some of that, and we are trying to do some of that. So uh, more, uh, uh, if someone has something uh, to contribute, please talk to us. Fascinating. Thank you. So, um, just wanted to first of all, I want to thank you to all the uh, members of the Liver Program. You know that participate. So, um, David Kleiner actually he sent a message here that if you have an antibody that works on paraffin embedded tissue, they could test it in some of the HCV cohorts. And um, another question from uh, Barbara Rehman, who is actually going to be one of our next speakers. Um, so, um, uh, which um, I'm sure we all, especially me, look very much forward to it. And uh, mm -hmm. she has a question: um, What holds interferon lambda on the cell surface or prevents its release? So, Shagun. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's my last. Okay. Yeah. So there are. We are, in, we, are, we are neck deep in studies on this now, and we're trying to use different methods, including site-directed mutagenesis to figure it out. One thing I can tell you is that it's not the receptor. So when we use CRISPR to knock out the receptor, it did not change the behavior of the protein. It's still bound to the cell surface. So we know it's not the receptor that is causing it. We suspect it might actually have to do with the um, the structure of the protein itself. Maybe it's, it's, maybe it's just sticky. We also did a, we also knocked out, uh, we knocked out the um, glycosylation site. And when we knocked out the glycosylation site, so it reduced effect, but it was not significant enough to tell us that this is the reason why it's not sticking. So we are still in the middle of it, but we do not know the full answer yet. But we know what we don't know. I hope that helps. Okay. I don't see any more questions. So um, I would like to thank uh, Miller and Sigun again for giving uh, a very, very interesting talk. Um, I'd like to uh, thank the audience, um, the, the audience, if, if I'm just so that everybody understands, because, you know, we all live virtual, we all are alone. 
there's 50 people on this call. So um, at least that's what I see here. So, you know, it's it's not that um, I think these these type of this type of mechanism actually works very well and, and we all um, getting used to this. So with this again, um, hold on. I'm not sure how to ask a question. Francis Baker. Um, but even though interferon lambda 4 has low expression, has a strong induction of ISGs, what happens if interferon lambda 4 is not present? Is ISG induction reduced? Yes. So, so let, let, let me expand on that a little. Miller, you want to? I want to chime in, Miller. You are mute. You're still on mute, Miller. Sorry. Okay, now you're fine. If, if you give me a, a privilege to share, I will show this slide I mentioned um, about distribution uh, in the world. Okay, well, while I'm sharing this slide, I can just tell. So, Francine, yes, when you have when you don't have lambda four genotype, your ISG levels are actually lower compared to um, uh, individuals who make lambda four. So, lambda four seems to be increasing the ISG signature. That has been um, we're not we're not the first to find that out. That was one of the initial observations that were made once IL twenty eight B was discovered. Okay, so uh, can you see uh, of distribution? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, this is, um, we are accumulating this data through different collaborators in, uh, this is basically the distribution of lambda-4 in the world and in uh, each dot correspond to a population, which is uh, about at least 50 individuals, uh, normal uh, population controls without any specific disease. And the darkest uh, brown color means the highest frequency of lambda-4, which is uh, obviously in, uh, in West Africa. And then there are African-Americans and also um, uh, Caribbeans, uh, African uh, from the Caribbean. And uh, the the uh, it, the frequency decreases in East Africa, and uh, very significantly decreases in North Africa. But then it's uh, it's the the difference between uh, Africa, especially uh, West Africa in Asia, is about 60 70 percent. So it's it's incredible that uh, evolution pushed this allele out of population uh, very quickly. It happened after uh, humans left Africa and populated Asia, and it doesn't happen just by drift. It means it's a very active selection. That means so uh, everyone who lost it, uh, these populations were basically eliminated. So they did not survive something. Uh, and whatever was going on in in, in those areas in that time, uh, smallpox or uh, pest and cholera, who knows? And even uh, the the flu, uh, which affected also Europe. This is uh, some snapshot of what happened. We just don't know what caused it. And, you know, God forbid we we, we never experience this again, uh, whatever these factors uh, meant. And we explore in a population in, in pediatric conditions, specifically in Africa. I'm not going to talk about it, but we we do explore malaria and gastrointestinal infection and uh, so respiratory infection. And we do see association specifically in Africa. So it, it does something, we just uh, don't have all the answers. Okay, thank you. So thank you, Mila. And um, let, uh, before I close, you know, let me um, tell you, so our next seminar is gonna be on um, this Tuesday, uh, Thursday, December 10. And I believe it's Barbara Rehman uh, who is going to talk and um, um, I hope I will all have you okay. online again in, in two or three weeks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.